Hi, I'm Tom Field, Vice President of Editorial with Information Security Media Group. I'm talking today about privileged access management. It's my pleasure to be speaking with Ken Ammon, Senior Advisor with CA Technologies. Ken, thank you so much for joining me today. Happy to be here, Tom. So privileged access management is a discipline that really has emerged quite a bit in the past year or so. In your experience, what do you find the security leaders especially most misunderstand about privileged access management? So if you were to ask me this question last year, mm -hmm. I would say that they probably misunderstand the connection between breach and lack of a privileged access management system. Uh, I think that a lot's happened in the market. There's been a lot of well-publicized loss. It's pretty clear so now, isn't it? It's pretty clear to them on that front. But yeah. So I have a different answer mm -hmm. now. And I think that, that what is largely misunderstood is the opportunity for improving and creating better process around your operations. And if you look at public cloud providers, the reason they can operate efficiently, cost-effectively, and securely is very, very structured. And they use many of the tenants that privileged access management brings to an enterprise customer as part of how they get there. Mm -hmm. So this year, I talk not only about security, but how to actually optimize operations or get closer to secure ops. So when you go into t organizations typically, where do you see the gaps? Are they in authentication? Is it reporting? Is it monitoring? What do you find? So we're, we're in a unique place in that we don't come into customers' environments and have to rip and replace or right. recommend they're, they're going to retire or something. Typically, they've been trying to accomplish this goal by cobbling together solutions with the existing framework, and it's very expensive, doesn't really work. and so. We come in and I think we are, are rapidly deployed. We allow them to create simplification in their environment, adopt multi-factor authentication, and bridge that to platforms that otherwise might not support that capability, and centrally manage it so that it simplifies what otherwise is a very distributed and challenging issue. Mm -hmm. As you see organizations going through this process, what do you see as their biggest technical as well as non-technical obstacles? So technically, we're really is a, uh, a fairly straightforward deployment. We get in, and, and somewhere around two weeks, we can have the system completely up and running. Mm -hmm. The change in how you do business, which is really a management change, you know, as well as some operational changes, you can actually take advantage of optimization once our platform is in place. And that is typically the customer's opportunity rather than challenge, because as they do change those operations, they become more efficient, there's better visibility, accountability, uh, yet there's some simplification for what used to be a world in which system administrators would have sticky notes all around their machine right. with passwords and have to remember all these logins. So over time, I think it's, it's ease of use, optimization, and security. Now, multi-factor authentication seems to be sort of a mixed bag, depending on what group you're, you're talking to or research study you're, you're implementing. It could be up to 50% of organizations haven't got there yet. What do you find the state of multi-factor authentication to be? What types do you see being used and how commonly are they being deployed? So we I think we have two scenarios, an outbreak between everybody else and the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. government for years has invested in the public key infrastructure, right. and they have this card called a PIV card, yeah. or it's a CAC card for the DOD folks. And But the, the real power of that card, and I've talked to a number of analysts that agree, is that it's not just a multi-factor authentication with biometrics and other things, but there's an identity on the card that's been investigated and vetted. So you have a single identifier for this very powerful privileged user in the enterprise along with multi-factor authentication. So very, very interesting, uh, powerful story that's taking place in government. The commercial sector, we see soft token from mobility. Yeah. We see you know, hard token. It's really a mixed bag. But I think the value of being able to adopt a platform for multi-factor and then bridge it to legacy systems as well as cloud-based and virtualized infrastructure is a key tenant of our opportunity. How commonly do you find MFA deployed now? So I think on the, the government side, it's Almost mandated. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone's there yet. Right. There's a, this thing called a cyber sprint they've been going through where right. they're trying to get this fully deployed. On the commercial side, I think most customers have multi-factor somewhere in the environment. Yeah. And it's typically uh, you know, rolling that for privileged users is 
simpler than the entire organization. So I think most organizations are either moving there or are there in particular with a lot of the well-advertised challenges around credential theft. Great. Uh, we've talked about this to some extent, but let's talk about what CA brings to the party here, particularly since the Exedium acquisition. How are you helping your customers to improve their approach to privileged access management? So, uh, you know, as typically happens with a venture-backed startup, you're going to gain the attention of somebody who's strategic in the marketplace yeah. and sees that capability fitting into the portfolio. And so CA is positioned around an application economy. Right. You, know, you see things moving into the cloud, and, and now network security really is abstracted out from applications talking to each other. So the Exedium acquisition brings that ability to solve legacy challenges for privileged users, but also bridge them into virtualized and cloud environments and matches really well with their application uh, economy story. Mm -hmm. the, from your experience working with customers on privileged access management, what are some of the lessons learned that you can share that might benefit organizations that are looking to move there now? So I would say that you, you if you're not fielding a privileged access management solution now, you, you should immediately get on it. They, it represents the greatest risk and entry point. Mm -hmm. So there's not a, a single attack where you know you haven't had that privileged user right. account at the core of it. And I think that there's real challenges around third party partners in that they, in many cases, are woven into the fabric of your network. Yeah. So mobility and outside support all but eroded this traditional security boundary. Mm -hmm. So the ability to extend and control the access of those 30 party vendors and monitor and contain them is, is key because there's many well-publicized attacks that all started with a third party vendor right. and you know unmanaged came in and wreaked havoc. Or their third parties. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Ken, I appreciate your time and insight today. Thanks so much. Thank you for the opportunity. The topic has been Privileged Access Management. I've been speaking with Ken Ammon, Senior Advisor with CA Technologies. For Information Security Media Group, I'm Tom Field. Thank you very much.